Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America website, thisweekinamerica.us. Back with us on the program, J. Brian Ross. He earned a B.A. and an M.A. in history from the University of Michigan, Ph.D. from Case Western Reserve University. Born in Boston, Brian frequented in Fenway Park, where he gained a lifelong devotion to Boston baseball. He acquired a passion for the, 19, the 1880 through 1914 time period. The back best-selling book, The Miracle Braves, when writing the new philanthropy, a case study that looks at the politics of charity during the first two decades of the 20th century, Ross has served as a history teacher, department chair at Hawkins School and Hathaway Brown School in Northeast Ohio, as well as Collegiate School in Richmond, Virginia. He's researched baseball history since 1997, when at Hathaway Brown School in Shaker Heights, Ohio, he organized a history conference celebrating the 50th anniversary of Jackie Robinson's breaking the color barrier of Major League Baseball. His book is Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. Brian was on the show, and we talked about this before. And if you go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us, you can go to iTunes, and you'll get a chance to listen to that interview. We'll recap it briefly uh, in a few minutes. But we got Brian back to talk about spring training. It's that time of the year. It's so exciting for baseball fans because all of us, no matter which team we're rooting for, are very optimistic at this time of year. We're going to talk about how spring training has evolved over the years. Jay Brian Ross, back with us on the program. Brian, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you back with us. Hey, well, I'm glad to be back, Rick. It's 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 good to hear you talk, and it's good that spring training is here again. Yeah, I hear your voice, and I'm thinking, okay, spring is not that far away, and we're actually going to be hearing play ball, and we're going to hear that uh, very shortly. We're hearing it now in Florida and, uh, and in Arizona. We're going to hear it all across the country. Just a, a couple of minutes here in talking about the, the excellent book, Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1940. Just sum up sort of what the book is about, because here is a team that was relegated to what was called baseball hell, the, the, the other team in Boston, a team that was, what, 15 games behind going into the summer and came back and won it all that year. Talk a little bit about the book. And again, go to, the, go to our website and, and go to iTunes and you'll hear the whole story. Uh, and better than that, go buy the book, Baseball's Greatest Comeback, <laughs> The Miracle Braves of 1914. This really is a great story, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it, it is. It's, I think it's one of baseball's greatest stories because it's, it's this worst-to-first story about a team that's been absolutely woeful for years and years, and they're playing in a, in a miserable park while uh, this is the Boston Braves, of course, of 1914. The, the Boston Red Sox of 1914 are playing in a spectacular park called Fenway Park. So the Braves have been woeful for years, and then the season starts off. There's some hope during their spring training in, of, 19, of 100 years ago in 1914. 14, um, but they end up just doing miserably f up until mid-July when they're 15 games out of first place and they're traveling and they go play a minor league team and they lose to that team. And so it, it, they are at, at the lowest of lowest points you could be and uh, they start pitching well, they start hitting well and they rise up, they beat an excellent team, the New York Giants, and then they go up against the great dynasty, the Philadelphia A's, one of the greatest teams of all time. They had just won three out of four World Series. They're coached by Connie Mack, one of the greatest managers of all time, and uh, they win the World Series. So it's one of these great worst-to-first stories. There are so many different aspects of this. This is the progressive era, era we were talking about. This is also uh, the country entering into World War One. You've got the dead ball area. The babe is arriving. The, the modern game is coming. So many different layers and elements, uh, aren't there, to the, to the story? Plus, it's the, the it's World War One is just beginning. So that's the the backdrop of this. This it's the summer of 1914, the August Madness when 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 Berliners and, and Parisians go out and cheer in the streets that the war is beginning. But then the war begins and thousands are are dying. And Americans are aware of the horrors of this of this war to a certain extent. They 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 watch it and they and they see it and you, and when I read when I did the research I would I would read the summer of 1914 I would see the headlines about for instance the Germans invading Belgium and, and then maybe right next to it something to the extent well Braves win third game in a row now they're back in the hunt so you would you would see the beauty of the baseball season up against the horrors of war. And Americans saw this, too, and I think they took even greater pleasure in this worst-to-first story of the Boston Braves of 1914 because they understood World War One. 
Our guest on This Week in America is J. Brian Ross. His website is jbrianross.com. The book is Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. It is an enjoyable and excellent read. The book's available all across the country. Information, of course, at Brian's website. And you can link on directly to Brian's website by going to thisweekinamerica.us. We want to talk on the program today about about spring training, and let's go back to that era. And and one of the people that I will talk about that we we mentioned before in connection with the Boston Braves is, is George Stallings. And explain briefly who he is, and then we'll talk about his philosophy of of spring training. Yes. Well, first of all, he was he was so he's a he's a coach of he's the he's the manager of the Braves in nineteen um, fourteen, and he's this worst to first manager he's brilliant in many ways i think he's one of the first managers to understand analytics he he understands on base percentage i think he understands platooning he's the f- first manager as far as i know to platoon to play you know left-handed hitters against right Handed pitchers on a, on a regular basis and, and vice versa. So he's doing that kind of thing. Yes, he's, he's interesting because he's also one of the most superstitious managers ever. He bans the color yellow. He carries <laughs> amulets with him. He he. Uh, there's a story about him that uh, during one, that he would during a rally he would freeze and stay in the same position that he started that when when the rally started. So he he's. The, the, the Braves are rallying. He, he freezes in position, but the rally goes on a long time. His back locks up, and they have to carry him off. But he's a, he's a fascinating guy, and uh, he, he had a, a rigorous spring training. He, had, he started to have, and, they were, and different people in the same time period were starting to have these rigorous, more systematic spring trainings. Branch Rickey. Starts to have he's he's in charge of the St. Louis Browns in 1914, and he's starting to have these um, three or four sliding pits and different batting cages, and he wants to make baseball that much more scientific. The word they used in the time. Well, one of the names that comes up is Frederick Winslow Taylor, and the people go, "I don't remember him from baseball." He was a, what an engineer and an efficiency expert, and they sort of followed what some of uh, some of his advice is. They were reestablishing what spring spring training was all about. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they they, they that's what they they went. Uh, that Taylor had it had huge impact on, on, on thinking in the time period. And, and, you know, and it's the kind of same kind of thinking that Henry Ford used when he they developed the assembly line. In fact, Model T's come off the assembly line in 1914, the same year that we're talking about this. And so there was this whole idea of, of thinking in a more systematic manner. And they were trying to do this. And, and uh, see, they, and, and they thought they'd be better uh, teams. And they, if you look at the history of spring training, um, they had it, it goes back a long time, but in the dead ball era in the 1890s, the, the one of the great teams, the Baltimore Orioles, realized that when they had spring training, they would do even better. Be, uh, small ball, this dead ball era baseball was very sophisticated because it involved stealing, it involved uh, sophisticated base running, hit and run. And um, you had to practice it a lot. So managers like Stallings started to re- realize that if we start in the spring, we're going to do better the rest of the season. So spring training, in a way, comes out of the 1880s, especially the 1890s. Uh, it has a long history. It goes way back to the 1860s even. Um, the, the New York Mutuals, which were run by Boss Tweed out of New York City, uh, was the first team to really use... Uh, spring training, but it goes back to the, it really has its origins in the dead ball era, the time period I write about. J. Brian Ross, our guest on the program, his website jbrianross.com. The book is Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. Information at our website, this week in America.us. Interesting, you mentioned in the book, during that time frame, and this is a few years before, what some of the baseball players would go through as they went through the, this offseason, they would come back and try to get themselves in shape. And there was, a, what, uh, what is it, a drink that they would consume? You talked about triacle? Oh, right. Yeah, from Alaska. They, well, on the one hand, they're all scientific. They think they have this scientific yeah, yeah. view, but on the other hand, they're trying these 
other remedies like that, thinking that this is going to make them healthier and pitch better and lower <laughs> weight. Um, but the, the, another thing about that, the dead ball era of um, spring training, too, that I should mention, too, is that, they, well, is that all the players had other jobs in the off season. It was very different from it, the way it is now. I mean, you needed to work as a shoe salesman. You needed to work doing something. So when they reported back in spring training, they were out of shape. Um, so Stallings, the manager of the, of the Braves and, and other similar managers, realized they had to get them back in shape. So they would run for hours. They would do drill for hours. And then they, and then they had these other methods like drinking these molasses to make them, that they thought might be some kind of cure to get them back in shape. So they had... Uh, some faulty reasoning by our standards today, but they, but they, but they had these rigorous, rigorous workouts. I, in the book, I mentioned it's somewhat of, of like a boot camp and a health spa at the same time. They would start, they would do these workouts, and they would just be miserably sore afterwards because they would be such long, arduous workouts. Well, and you talk in the book, baseball's greatest comeback, the Miracle Braves of 1914. The fans considered this a pleasure junket. They were all for this. But from a player standpoint, they called it hard work, pains, aches, strenuous self-denial, and hours of thought. They they even spent metal time trying to trying to get mentally back in shape for the season. Oh, they did because they, they were they had just been away for I mean for months at a time doing something entirely differently so they had to they had to get themselves back in shape players like Johnny Evers who I write about at length had I mean he would come back and goes he's going over the rule book over and over again making sure that he knew every angle of the game so when the season started he would be prepared he was probably one of the most of uh, uh, strong he was one of the strongest advocates of this new scientific baseball I'm talking about how did the Grapefruit League start? What's the beginning of that? Yeah, well, the Grapefruit League goes back to really, I'd say, that goes back to the late teens, early 1920s. Um, it starts primarily in, in St. Petersburg, Florida, where there's a guy named Al Lang, who is a businessman and a promoter who just thinks it will be a great idea if he can attract Florida teams. Now, there had been some teams in Florida before then. There had been teams across the South. There had been in Texas, Arkansas, all over the place. But they, they really start to then move down toward St. Petersburg in the early 1920s. And by 1920s, by the end of the 1920s, most of the, of the baseball teams do have, perm, have, have, have teams in, in Florida. I almost said the word permanent, and I have to be careful with that because one thing about spring training is that uh, – these baseball teams over the last 70 years or so have moved from place to place to place. They don't seem to, to stay in the same place well, at yeah, all. Yeah, you and used I to be able to. movement in the next 50 years. Well, yeah, because you got cities and states vying for them. It used to be if you mentioned a team, I could tell you where they went for spring training anymore. you got to sort of like uh, look it up on the Internet to make sure that, you, that you're correct in that. That's right, you do. Uh, teams change all the time. Now it seems to be pretty secure. There are 15 teams in Arizona. There are 15 teams in, in, in Florida. And um, in the last 20 years or so, it seems as if it's solidified that those, that, that, and, and that those teams will stay in place. But uh, in the, around 1999, early 2000, there were five or six teams thinking about moving to Las Vegas to form the Oasis League. I mean, they seriously considered that. They, the team executives went out to Las Vegas. They looked around. They thought about it. Um, and that, I think, is always a possibility in the future, too. I, there, there are a number of leases that are coming up on some of the Florida teams, and um, in Las Vegas would like to attract baseball teams. I mean, they've got some college basketball games going on there now. I mean, and they would like to have uh, more sports there, and that that is a possibility. And and uh, Las Vegas has the has the uh, revenue sources to to pay for state of the art stadium so we'll see what happens in the future interesting you don't know. yeah we might hear about the oasis league and you mentioned now that that the, the teams are split between the cactus and the and the grapefruit leagues one that many years ago cactus league didn't have all, all that many teams out there talk about how suddenly they're they're the equal of of what's going on in florida 
Yeah, well, in the in the late eight, 1980s, they went through a rough time of sorts. There was, um, if you remember, Martin Luther King Day was uh, not being celebrated yes. as a holiday in Arizona, and there was some uh, discontent among the uh, among uh, certain teams there. But then, in the late 19, late uh, 80s and early 90s, um, there are attempts made and there are propositions passed by different counties in Arizona that basically allow um, stadiums to be built through rental car taxes, sales taxes, public money goes to um, different teams. And then also teams start to realize that if you can put two teams at the same facility you can make a lot of money. So, for instance, now Cincinnati and Cleveland are at the same facility in, in, in Goodyear, Arizona. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a set of pairs like that, and so that's, that's a, it's a, that becomes a good way for a, uh, for a team to gain revenue. By the way, that's a, that's a big change in spring training, too, is that um, it, now teams look for spring training to provide more revenue. When spring training began in the dead ball era, the time that I studied, it was an expense. But now, clearly, it's a way for teams to make money. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Al Lang, and there was Al Lang Field. I don't know whether th that is still is there or not, or whether they have a corporate name on it, because we see that so often now. Yeah, in spring training, attaching sponsors to spring training and the different rituals of spring training. Our guest on the program is Jay Brian Ross. His book is called Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. We're talking about uh, spring training when all of us are optimistic about our team. And a few minutes left in the program. Let's go to 1947, and Jackie Robinson comes on the scene. What impact did that have on on spring training? Yeah, that is, that's a fascinating question. Um, you would think, at first glance, it would have a huge impact yes. because it had such a tremendous impact on baseball overall. I mean, when, when Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier in 1947, then baseball is, is, is forever changed pretty much in the north. I mean, it's going to be the stadiums will be integrated. The game itself will be integrated by the 1950s. I'd say 10% of the uh, players are, are African American. So you think, ah, baseball has changed. However, Baseball continued to have spring training in Florida, and Florida was a Jim Crow state, so that meant that baseball was still segregated during spring training. I've, I'm not sure if you ever if you've seen the movie uh, 42, and you've seen the the, the 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 very first part of the film where Jackie Robinson. Uh, shows up in Florida and the difficulties that he's had getting there and some of the taunting that occurred and, and that kind of thing that, um, well, that kind of thing went on for a long, for up until the 1960s. So um, spring training stayed segregated from 1947 to 1964. And there was, within spring training, there was this mini civil rights movement to get things changed. And Jackie Robinson was a big person behind that. Jay Brian Ross, our guest on the program. His book is Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. It's an excellent book. It's interesting as I'm reading, and everybody now is concerned about pitching count. And we have all these pitchers, and this is just uh, you know spring training, and they're going down. They're going to have to have many of them Tommy John surgery, oh, Tommy wow. John surgery, and many of them for the, the second or even the third time. You talk about uh, Joe McGinnity, uh, a pitcher back in 1903, when in one month he pitched both games of a doubleheader three times, and he won all six of those. Pitch count was not something they were really. Billy Bean wasn't around. They weren't, really weren't worried about analytics back at that point, were they? In terms of pitchers, he just grabbed the ball, he went out and threw it. Yeah, that's one thing they did not understand. They they allowed pitchers, as you said, to pitch over 300 innings, or or like. Iron Joe to to, pill, to pitch two games of a doubleheader, um, but when I read the records, I think that it was undoubtedly harmful to them. I mean, they, we, for instance, the the top pitcher of the Braves, the the in 1914 is Bill James. He's, this is Bill James, the pitcher, and he pitches well over 300 innings. The next year he goes out for the Braves, 
and he 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 hurt his shoulder. He, 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 and he's his career's over. Uh, you read about other pitch. You you read about other pitchers. This kind of thing happening, and I don't think anyone's made a systematic study of dead ball era pitchers and what happens to these guys. I mean, some somehow can survive. Um, some of them can pitch well over 300 innings. Christy Mathewson, uh, Walter Johnson, they can do it year after Cy Young, did it year after year. But I think most of them had faced uh, severe arm problems. And, uh, and so um, it, it, was, it was a challenge for them, too. The book is a fascinating read, Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. Jay Brian Ross, our guest on the program. I'll extend it another minute because there's so many interesting things to talk about. During that era, that 1914, that, that era, not necessarily that year, is that when we saw a change from a, a lot of amateur players to where baseball really became more organized and independent on professional players at, at that point? Oh, I think so. I think you see a whole shift to professionalism. Um, I think that it's embodied in Fenway Park too. Fenway Park is built in 1912, and 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 all these other parks too. Just about the same time, Ford's Field, Wrigley Field, um, and these are iron and concrete stadiums. And you can now take the trolley there. Pretty soon, you can get your car there. So you have this. It's a, it's you've got these professional stadiums and the owners realize this is a pretty this is a sophisticated business now we're getting 35 40,000 fans uh, we have to make this whole game more sophisticated so in the 1890s you had small stadiums and you had players who were pretty rough and tough um, by the end of the dead ball era by 1920 or so it's uh, it's it's a game where you're you're paying your players fairly well compared to the rest of the, uh, the society. And you have a few stars like, and during the dead ball era, Christy Mathewson, who's going out doing advertisements and uh, who are on Broadway and who are extremely well known throughout the country. So it's got these elements of professionalism that we, that, we, that we now know so well. Jay Brian Ross, our guest on the program. The book is called Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. I really enjoyed this book. Are you working on uh, a book at the present time? Oh, I have, I have a few other things in mind. I'm, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, I'm starting an article on spring training and the history of that and the, and the part that I was just talking about in, the, in, the, in, the, in this, this mini civil rights movement that takes place during, the, during uh, 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 spring training yes. and, and, and how it changes things and how Robinson and Wendell Smith were involved and how the St. Louis Cardinals, um, people like Bill White, changed things. So I'm working on that, and I've got a, a number of other uh, a number of other projects in mind, too. We will stay in touch and love to have you back in the program. J. Brian Ross, our guest on the show, his website, jbrianross.com. The book, Baseball's Greatest Comeback, The Miracle Braves of 1914. Information available, of course, and you can link on directly to Brian's website at thisweekatamerica.us. Brian, great to have you back in the program. Baseball's here. We'll have you back. All right. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. You're listening to This Week in America, website thisweekatamerica.us.